giving hasn't gone down, it's gone back. So I think that's what we need to focus on. If we've gone back to normal for giving, it hasn't really decreased. I'm Rich Frazier. And I'm Russ Fanos. Welcome to the Nonprofit Fundraising Exchange, a podcast from IPM Advancement. We believe strong nonprofits can change the world. And our goal with each episode is to bring you insightful conversations with thought leaders from the nonprofit sector. Let's dive in. Hey, welcome back, listeners, to the Nonprofit Fundraising Exchange. I'm your host, Rich Frazier. So today we're going to discuss the newly released Giving USA annual report on philanthropy. So if you're like me, when the highlights from the report were released last month, your inbox looked a little alarmist. But we've taken a close look, and we're here to reassure you the sky is not falling. So don't panic. We're going to dig into some of the specifics of the report, assess what nonprofits should and shouldn't take away from it, and also make some helpful recommendations for how we can navigate today's donor landscape. So joining me are two of my favorite IPM teammates, Samantha Timlick and Dr. Colton Strasser. Samantha and Colton, thank you so much for joining me on the panel today. I'm excited to hear your thoughts about the Giving USA report. Before we start our discussion, why don't you take a moment and introduce yourselves to our listeners and describe your background in nonprofit fundraising. Samantha, I'm going to start with you. You know I love going first, Rich. This is Samantha Timlick. I am the VP of Client Services at IPM Advancement. I have been with the company since inception, which means I've been doing this for a while. And my, you didn't ask this part, but my favorite part of nonprofit fundraising is the annual fund. That is where I love to chat and plan things out. So that's probably where a lot of my feedback is going to come from today, from that lens. And you are my go-to peep when it comes to annual funds. So thanks for joining today. And Colton Strasser, you are no stranger to the show. Thanks for coming back and talking to us about the Giving USA report. Yeah, well, thanks for having me again. Uh, so Dr. Colton Strasser, I'm a consultant and I'm also an academic. Uh, we refer to ourselves as pracademics. We're practitioners and academics. So um, I do some uh, teaching at universities around fundraising. Um, I also do stuff around strategic planning and a lot of national reports um, on nonprofit data, nonprofit fundraising. You know, And one of those examples is the IPM report we did um, on uh, LGBTQ nonprofit throughout the country. So um, that's kind of what I spend my time. I'm the data nerd. So I'll be sharing some some nerdy stuff around data. And we love the nerdiness about you, Colton. Thanks for joining us. All right. So let's jump in here. Let's summarize for listeners a few of the high level findings in the report, and then we can dig in deeper. So overall giving, according to the report, down 499 billion in 2022, which represents a 3.4% decline, 10.5% decline when adjusted for inflation. Okay, but really, we're still at 499 billion giving in the US, which ain't bad. Individuals are responsible for 64% of giving. Foundations are stepping up at 21%, bequests 9%, corporations at 6%. Individual giving dropped 6.4%. Uh, in current dollars, uh, dropped uh, 13.4% when adjusted for inflation. Small dollar donors are decreasing, which means fewer households are giving, uh, with uh, major gifts playing a larger role, 5% of individual giving for both 2021 and 2022. And all sources are down, but corporate giving faring uh, the best, a 3.4% increase. Way to go, corporations, for stepping up and giving more money because we've been seeing them decreasing their giving over the years. So, Colton, Samantha, what jumped out at you? Samantha, I'm going to let you go first. Anything that surprised you? You know, I wasn't really surprised. Again, taking it from the framework of of the annual fund, the decrease in giving that we're seeing here is really mirrored in the decrease in particularly direct mail response rates that we saw a lot of last year. We also saw a lot of average gifts coming up. So response rate down, average gift up. And that tends to happen when major givers hold their donations at about the same level as they've done before or increase it while those lower level donors are giving less frequently and sometimes even lower dollars at those lower levels. Colton, 
the report's always been interesting and you know we're going to talk probably more about this but it's just a report um it's not a fortune cookie it is not a <laughs> um report card it's not a whatever and it's also important to remember how this report is sampled. Um, and so, you know, it, it's well done in terms of the methodology, but it doesn't always include everything. So if folks are thinking, wow, my community is actually really generous, what's with all these drops of numbers? Well, congratulations, your community is just really generous. So it's not anything to hold on to too tightly, but there's two things I find kind of interesting. It's one, inflation. Um, this is one of the only reports that uses inflation adjusted dollars, which I think is helpful-ish. Um, but it's also, um, you know, inflation's gone up a lot. It's the highest it's ever been. And I think the last 40 years or something like that. Um, and so like inflation affected giving, there's no way around it. Sure. Then also COVID. You know, when giving um, was increased, you know, in 2020, 2021, 2022, um, if folks are thinking that, you know, needle was still going to keep going up, um, it was kind of a, a, a bad strategy because people are extra generous oftentimes when things are going wrong. You know, 2008, you know, with the stock market and housing crisis and then, you know, global pandemic and um, you know, it's just, I, I think you should have expected a drop, um, or, um, what we're doing now is one of my colleagues is calling it a plateau. You know, we're kind of evening out, you know, regular amounts, same giving. And, you know, that's kind of the interesting slash somewhat surprising thing is that the numbers don't surprise me, but I'm surprised at how some people were surprised. Well, exactly. And we, we even did an episode on, that way back at the beginning of the pandemic about how giving increases in times of trouble in, in, in this country. Let's talk about um, donor advised funds. Did we learn anything about donor advised funds from the latest report, Colton? So donor advised funds within this report, you know, they're saying it's the largest growing kind of chunk um, of, you know, the, the report and also giving to foundations is going up. I think it's also kind of important to note that giving to foundations hasn't really been historically tracked too well. And so I think the fact that it's growing and becoming a larger piece of the pie is just because of the fact that they're tracking it more. Um, the other challenge is it only captures giving once. So when you put money into a donor advised fund, it'll show up in the year that you give the money, but it won't show up in the years that grants are coming out of it or that other things are happening. Um, but I also think in terms of individual giving, um, and I say this all the time, it's important to recognize that a DAF is not a person. Um, you know, donor advised funds are a giving vehicle. It's a charitable savings account if we want to break it down to that. It's not a checking account. I know nonprofits are like, how can we capture money from DAFs? I'm like, you can't. They're not people. Uh, so you have to capture donors that just happen to have a DAF um, in order to capture it. So I think there always needs to be kind of an asterisk when we talk about donor advised funds. I totally agree, Colton. From a practical perspective, I'm definitely seeing more nonprofits actively soliciting DAF funds, but they're doing that as part of a normal solicitation and just including DAFs as a means by which a donor can make a gift. So it does feel like, I know they've been around forever, but they've certainly been hotter lately. And it feels like nonprofits really got on board with that pretty quickly. The other thing that a lot of nonprofits have done well with DAFs compared to some other types of giving, I'm seeing a lot better tracking in terms of CRMs. Lots of times non-direct cash gifts mess with the nonprofit's revenue tracking, and it can also mess with ask calculations when you're trying to decide, okay, how much do you want to ask this donor for based on what they have given before? But it feels like people really got on board with DAFs right away and that they're tracking them appropriately. So I think that's always good news to have good data in your system. So Samantha, I'm going to stay with you talking about individual giving as a percentage of disposable personal income. It dropped to the lowest point that's been since 1995. What do I make of that? I think sometimes the people just overcorrect in the face of uncertainty. It may have simply be that costs are going up and people perceive that they then have less to give and so they give less. I don't think most donors are looking at their giving as a percentage of their disposable income. They look at it as, what do I feel comfortable giving right now? And when things are uncertain, people are less comfortable, and so they give less. 
Colton, do you want to add something? Yeah, the economy is always going to be a factor in how we're guiding our spending. You know, if we're making lots of money, we might give lots of money. Um, but, you know, like Samantha said, there's an uncertainty and, you know, people want to feel financially secure. So, you know, thinking about, you know, making giving more accessible or illustrating the importance of small gifts. Um, I think a lot of people sometimes don't give because organizations put such a focus on major gifts or capital campaigns and other things that, you know, sometimes the smaller individual donor that, you know, could be on your annual fund list, could be, you know, someone you're engaging on social media, you know, they don't think their $50 is going to make a difference. And also figuring out how can we, um, you know, encourage giving in a bite-sized way, you know, as a millennial myself, if you ask me for $500 today, I'd be like, that's $500. Um, but if you ask me to do $50 a month, I'm like, oh, well, that's easy. It, you know, will kind of blend in on my credit card statement, you know, Netflix, Disney Plus, Amazon Music, chef organization near and dear to my heart, uh, etc. And it's just, you know, it's $50 versus 500. And also for mathematicians, that's $600 a year instead of 500. And it's more predictable that if you have monthly givers giving small amounts, you can project that more than me potentially giving you 500 every December. So I think we need to find ways to frame things and make giving easy. Uh, and there's a ton of platforms out there to make recurring giving, um, you know, something super simple and uh, still impactful. So letting, I hate the phrase, every dollar helps, but you know, also helping people realize that indeed every dollar helps if lots of people are giving dollars. So pitch in Colton, just pitch in a couple of dollars. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, so uh, I think, you know, helping people understand that everyone can give and like, it's going to take those, you know, $50 donations to help keep the organization afloat and to do the important programs rather than that person that just cuts a, you know, $5,000 check every year, which, you know, we need both of those types of donors. Sure. Let's carry that thought forward then uh, and talk about where the money is going. After ingest adjusting for uh, inflation, it looks like the, the sectors that are getting increased giving were foundations and international affairs. So what do we want to say about that, Samantha? Now I got to take back what I said about there not being any surprises for me in this report. Samantha. I know, I know. I'm pretty sure it's my prerogative. I've been told that. At any rate, the uh, one of the things that I did think was interesting, maybe not surprising, but at least interesting, is the increase in giving to international efforts. And the reason I say that's interesting is because it's counter to what we saw for several years, where there was this big drive to sort of fix things here at home. And I will let everyone draw their own conclusions about where that might have come from. But, you know, I think, for instance, about this annual fund client we have, they primarily work in South America and the Caribbean, but they raise all of their money here in the States. And there was a point not too long ago where we were getting a lot of pushback from lapsed donors and prospective donors who would say something to the effect of wanting to support more efforts in their own backyard, needing to sort of fix things here at home. We have enough problems here at home. I just, I can't justify sending my money out of the United States. It seemed to be this, this general feeling. We heard it a lot, particularly like on the phones when we were talking to people and, and they were giving us this sort of direct feedback. Um, I think maybe the war in Ukraine shifted that for some people. I think maybe the political landscape shifted that for some people, and that may be where it's coming from. But I did find that interesting. And Colton, you, you're, you have another thought here. Yeah, so in terms of the foundations, um, you know, that whole transfer of wealth we've been talking about for it seems like 40 years is actually starting to happen. Um, and so I work with a lot of community foundations and they're seeing a lot of these bequests come in, a lot of planned giving increasing. And so, you know, when it really comes to foundations, um, yeah, I'm not super surprised that they're seeing this large increase in giving because you know, the, the time has come where the transfer of wealth is actually happening. And I think it's it's promising for the sector as a whole um, if, you know, folks pay attention to, um, you know, the, the movement of wealth. Foundation giving grew by two and a half percent in 2022, Go Foundations, but it wasn't able to keep up with inflation. So their $105 billion in giving was actually a decline of 5% with adjusted for inflation. So what other what are what other factors influence the numbers? Um, Samantha, stock market? 
Definitely. Um, I think that's definitely a factor in some cases. Um, I did want to touch on inflation real quickly. And I think, yes, a dollar doesn't go as far as it did. But part of the issue with inflation, with individual donors at least, is just that it is in the news. And so people may be using it as an excuse not to give, regardless of whether it is personally impacting them or not. It is one of the things that we hear a lot on the phones when we're having conversations with donors. Oh, I just can't give today. You know, inflation's at a 40-year high. It's like, yeah, I know, I know. So Stock market. So I did see a report um, came out a couple of months ago by Canda. That's, you know, they were GuideStar before. And they said that 27% of foundations who responded to this survey of theirs anticipate granting out less money this year compared to last year. 23% they said they're going to increase. 50% are staying the same. This report's been um, running for about, I think, seven years, they said. And this is the first time that they have ever seen more foundations expecting a decline versus those who are planning to increase. And the foundations specifically who said that they plan to give out less money this year referenced their reduced asset values and a negative outlook on the stock market performance. So I think that the stock market tends to impact the higher dollar donors and the foundation giving as well. Hi, this is Curtis Schmidt, producer of the Nonprofit Fundraising Exchange. If you're a nonprofit professional who has questions about your program, or maybe you feel like you've taken your advocacy, fundraising, or membership effort as far as you can and you need some fresh ideas, then we have a special offer for you today. NPFX podcast listeners can get a free 30-minute consultation with IPM Advancement, no strings attached, when you go to ipmadvancement.com forward slash free. Just enter a few details and an IPM team member will contact you to follow up. It's that easy. That website again is ipmadvancement.com forward slash free. Thanks for listening and we hope to talk to you soon. Now let's return to the episode. Tell me about the income gap, Samantha. So that was another interesting report. Give.org came out uh, with about a month and a half ago or so. And they basically surveyed people, um, individuals who tend to give to charity, but have stopped at some point in the past five years. So they used to donate and they have stopped. 47% of people who stopped giving said that they felt like wealthier people could afford to give more. So they should pull back on their own giving, sort of this, hey, I'm being impacted more by this economy. Let's let the rich people take care of these nonprofits. Um, and, and the rate jumped up to 59% when they were looking at households over $70,000 income. So I think that that goes along with inflation as well. People hear about inflation. People hear about this, how the wealthier are giving more, and they sort of use those reasons as as their own reasons for not giving. And I'm not saying they're not valid, but I think that it, it goes along with the news that is out there and what people are hearing and how that can sort of impact what they choose to give and when they choose to give. Colton? Yes to all of that. And also to, you know, recognize that this report, it uses 990 data. And I use a ton of 990 data in my work, and I also use tax returns and all, you know, a whole bunch of different data that comes into this. But um, one of the things to recognize is that there's a lot of giving that can't be tracked. And there's a lot of giving, I think, that happened during COVID that isn't trackable. Also, you know, we have different giving sources that just aren't included in here. One of them is, you know, retirement. Um, so if you have a required minimum distribution that you're going to make to a nonprofit, it's not tracked in this report because it is, you know, it's tracked somewhere else. Uh, a colleague in mine tried to figure out how can we figure out how many donations are coming from charitable contributions from retirement accounts. And we dug deep and we're like, yep, nope. Uh, so we tried to find it um, and we it's not super trackable. And then you also have different types of funding, like, you know, uh, crowdfunding, you have online giving in some places that isn't just necessarily trackable because it's not technically a charitable contribution, it's more mutual aid. And then, you know, in previous years, stock market was doing really well. So there was a huge increase in assets put into donor advice funds um, last year because the stock market was doing really well. And so donor advice funds then did really well. And so when our stock market does well, our foundations do well, and then they can spend more. So it's connected. 
Um, and also foundations are being super duper generous throughout the pandemic and we're paying out more um, than their, you know, private foundations were paying more than their 5%. Community foundations were, you know, raising money and spending more money. Um, so I think this whole um, foundations will, you know, kind of are planning to anticipate on spending less. I think it's also because they spent more um, previously. And then also they need to have their, you know, assets readjust to, you know, the fluctuating economy. So. So Colton, what I'm hearing then is that we had some types of giving like crowdfunding and donations from IRAs and rapid response giving that aren't trackable. So that could give a false impression of a decrease in giving. Yeah, especially because a lot of giving happens to and within community. And so Giving USA is only tracking institutional giving. So giving to nonprofits that, you know, report out. Um, and, you know, also it's because, you know, people don't itemize their taxes the way they used to. And so this is like, you know, an estimate, uh, you know, it probably is more because I, I think the report takes a more conservative estimate of giving, but you know, recognizing that a lot did happen in the last couple of years. And, you know, there's just some stuff we can't track. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, an interesting way of kind of knowing where giving's going and all these things. But um, people are giving to other different things. And, you know, tracking international giving is, gets complicated, especially if you're not giving to a nonprofit in the U.S., you're giving to a nonprofit elsewhere and, you know, all that stuff. So um, I tell people not to look at the numbers too closely because, you know, they're, not set in stone. They're kind of our estimated guess. More about trending. Mm -hmm. So while annual snapshots like this report are important, they don't tell the whole story. Numbers don't tell us why. So where should listeners be cautious in drawing conclusions? What should they not take away from this report? I think Colton touched on a lot of of sort of the shortcomings of the report um, in terms of dollars that are not being tracked and, and, and can't really be well tracked. So I do think you have to take the numbers with a grain of salt. I do think it's best to look at trends instead of overall numbers. And I think the other thing that that nonprofits should not take away from this is don't let yourself off the hook. Don't look at these negative trends you might be seeing in your own data and dismiss them because, you know, nonprofit giving was down. I wish you guys could all see my quote fingers right now. It is still important to analyze your results and ask yourself if you're doing the things that you should be doing to encourage folks to give. Are you asking? Are you providing a compelling case for support? Are you stewarding donors? Are you acknowledging their gifts promptly and authentically? We can't just have our hands out all the time. I know I talk about this a lot, but that's, I think that's one of the big takeaways is look at this. It's, it's a good frame. It's a good way to look at your organization and why, you know, the last year or so may have been challenging, but you still really need to double down on your best practices. Colton. I totally agree. You know, you got to look at your own data. You know, like Sam said, trend data is fun. Uh, you know, it's important to look at, but also seeing, you know, that there are, you know, community contexts in place. So just because funding might be down in the arts, for example, doesn't mean your organization as an arts organization needs a plan for a deficit. You know, you got to look at your own trend data, your own database to see where are you currently getting, you know, funding and not. The one thing that I think you should take away from the report here, though, is, you know, kind of the percentage of individual giving, you know, planned giving has started to take, you know, our bequests has been, you know, increasing and increasing. And so if your organization hasn't thought about planned giving or, you know, created some type of opportunity for people to become educated on planned giving, um, now's the time to do that um, because, you know, folks are thinking of these things and, you know, it's just important to have the initial conversation. Taking the pandemic out of the picture, if we compare 2019 to today, what story does that tell us, Colton? It's a both good, bad, and ugly uh, kind of thing with the pandemic. You know, I like to say it has some silver lining to it because what it really did was point um, a spotlight on the nonprofit sector as a societal safety net. Um, you know, people were turning to nonprofits to get food, to help stay in their homes, to, you know, find jobs, you know, all these different things. And so, um, which is really great. Um, but if organizations were kind of just thinking like, oh, well, this is our new normal. 
um, and they weren't planning for when the ARPA grants, you know, dried up or all this stuff. I know all these nonprofits that hired more staff, did more work, did more service. I'm like, well, we were in a crisis, you know, and they're now thinking, well, how am I going to maintain this? And I'm like, well, the hard reality is you probably can't, um, you know, if you were working with your donors to help fill in the gap, great. But, you know, it's really important to recognize that giving's going to go back to where it was. Giving hasn't gone down, it's gone back. Um, so I think that's what we need to focus on. If we've gone back to normal for giving. It hasn't really decreased. So if you take out, you know, the pandemic years, we'll call them, um, you know, giving doesn't look too bad. Basically, the answer is like, oh, well, it's, you know, if you pretend 2020 through 2022 didn't exist, we're like, oh, well, it's the same as 2019. That's great. Uh, so it's, you know, it's all about how you want to read the numbers. Okay. Samantha, inflation and other factors have left uh, nonprofits with fewer resources, higher costs, increasing demand for their services. So given the current landscape, what can we recommend to help nonprofits strengthen their fundraising programs for the rest of 2023 and 24? Well, when it comes to the annual fund, I am sure that no one here is surprised to hear me say that nonprofits should double down on their best practices. In fact, I think I said it a few minutes ago, and that they should generally stay the course. Fundraising is tough right now. I get it. Prospecting is even tougher. And I know it can be really hard to look at your increasing net cost per new donor, for example, and hold your commitment to bringing new donors on the file. Mm -hmm. And it's especially tough if you also have to defend lower dollar fundraising to your board, for example, because they're looking at the numbers too and saying, hey, most of our revenue is not coming from these small dollar donors. Is it really worth investing in them? My suggestion is always take a deep breath. <gasps> yes, start there. <laughs> start there. Start with looking at your annual fund and remembering what it is here to do. Its job is not primarily to bring dollars in the door, although we do want to be doing that. It is really the pipeline that is going to lead to those larger and sustained gifts. Yes. Yes. And as a quick aside, this is something you should be able to prove in your data if you have to. If you dig in and you look at your most supportive donors, look at how they came onto the file. Often when we conduct this kind of analysis for clients, we find that the first interaction a larger donor has with your organization is through the annual fund. They make a direct mail gift. They respond to an email appeal. Something to that effect, they come in with a smaller dollar gift or a recurring gift and sort of signal that they are interested in a deeper relationship with your organization. But that's a bit of a side. I just, I know it's always important to have data backing up your investments internally, and you absolutely should follow that information. But my point here is that in order to keep your pipeline healthy and generate those large and sustaining gifts in the future, you've got to invest in bringing new donors on the file and in fighting your current donor attrition. And both of those require focus and a sustained investment. This is not a one and done thing. It's not something you can just mm -hmm. take a year off from because, because giving is down. Maybe you don't go big. Maybe you don't test a new package. Maybe you don't test a bunch of new rental lists or something to that effect. But it is always the right time to provide consistent outreach, solicitation, and stewardship of your existing donors, and to make sure that you are replacing donors at at least the same rate that they're falling off of your files. So tracking your retention and attrition rates and making sure that you're keeping your file as healthy as possible so that when things get better and when donors are ready to give again, you are there and ready to be the recipient of that generosity. Colton, do you have something to add? Yeah, so I'm going to echo the annual fund. Um, and then I also previously mentioned some planned giving and looking at you know, how to build that within your organization. So if you've been around for, I would say, maybe 25 plus years, you know, really working with donors on talking about legacy gift planning. And that doesn't mean you need to hire a full-time plan giving person, but, you know, you can have a partnership with your local community foundation or some other place to help facilitate that. And then also with the annual fund, I've been doing a lot of training for small nonprofits lately. And, you know, I asked them, what happens after you get the check? And they're like, we send you a thank you note. I'm like, well, and then what happens? They're like, what do you mean what happens? So, you know, I think a lot of fundraising shops spend so much time working on the front end where they forget the back end. Um, and so helping keep folks, um, you know, involved and aware of what's happening and, 
you know, these, uh, you know, national numbers aren't going to save you. Um, and, you know, these conversations around, oh, well, we need more DAF contributions or, well, oh, maybe Mackenzie Scott will give us a million. I'm like, no, you got to focus on building your internal shop um, and having a process and procedure. So, you know, fundraising at most organizations is rarely the number one problem. It's the number one felt symptom that we don't have enough money. But in my work, if, you know, if you do good work, measure your good work and tell people about the good work you're usually able to do fundraising well. And so, you know, don't look at, you know, giving USA or all these other things and just say, oh, well, we're having a crisis. Like look at your own internal operations and numbers and figure those things out. Yes, Colton, I am clapping and snapping or whatever we do here to say that we agree. <laughs> usually we just say we agree, but if you want to clap and snap, let's, let's do it. Excellent. Let's do all the things. <laughs> hey, this is a great conversation. It's a lengthy report. We could have a lengthier podcast if we wanted to, but I want to get to the takeaways. So for our listeners, I'm sure they've learned a lot, but if listeners could take away one thing from this episode, something we've talked about or something we haven't talked about, what would that be? Colton. So I think national data is helpful, but it's really the local stuff that matters. You know, all these national reports talking about what's happening either in your state or in the globe or, you know, whatever, uh, but focusing more on your own data and maybe how that aligns and doesn't with these reports is, you know, it's a helpful exercise, but don't get caught up in the data. Um, and, you know, it's really important to remember that fundraising is all about relationships. So recognizing that individuals are still the largest giving group, um, but, you know, also encouraging folks to consider corporations and foundation donors like their major donors. So oftentimes when you look at your top donors, you'll see that usually it's foundations and corporations that are your biggest contributors. And so, you know, technically speaking, 100% of giving comes from individuals. Yes. Every check is signed by somebody. Exactly. So somebody has to make a decision. It just might come from a corporate account versus a personal checking. And so I think what a lot of nonprofits kind of skip over is, you know, they don't treat their foundation or corporate donors as major gifts folks. And, you know, they don't, you know, share with them some of the wins that are happening in the organization. They're not stewarding them. They're basically submitting um, a couple pieces of paper every year that says, please give me money. We love you. And we do good work. And that's the only time they hear from you. So don't treat foundations and corporations like ATM machines because they're not. Uh, so build relationships with everybody. And like you said, Rich, everyone signs a check. So there's an individual person that usually signs it. Um, so just being aware of that and keeping them involved in your work and top of mind. I'm doing all the snapping and clapping in agreement with you, Colton. <laughs> Samantha, anything to add? I just want to echo everything that Colton said and then go back to what I said before about nonprofits really weathering the storm when they need to. So when when gifts are down, when the economy is tough, not retreating and not pulling way back because that's that's going to hurt you in the future. You've got to find a way to maintain some sort of steady drumbeat um, where you are staying in front of your donors and you are continuing to bring new donors onto the file. Thank you very much. Hey, friends, where can listeners find out more about you and the work that you do? Let's start with Dr. Colton Strasser. So you can find out more about me on my website, which is coltonstrasser.com. And I'm also proud to be working with IPM on some different things. And uh, you can find out more information about them on uh, ipmadvancement.com. And Samantha Timlick. Well, see, Colton's just taken all my answers. I am a part of the IPM Advancement team. So if you need to find me, you go to ipmadvancement.com. I'm also on LinkedIn. And, you know, particularly about that annual fund, man, I love to chat about it. So give me a call. All right. Hey, thank you again, Samantha Timlick, Dr. Colton Strasser. Thank you to our producer, Mr. Curtis Schmidt, who keeps me in line and keeps me from looking stupid most of the time. Russ Faniff, whatever you want to do, is all right with me because you make me feel so brand new. And to you, our listeners, thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time on the Nonprofit Fundraising Exchange. That concludes this episode of the Nonprofit Fundraising Exchange. Thanks to our panel for sharing their insights and expertise. If you'd like to learn more about our panel members or any of the organizations or resources featured in this episode, we will include links in the show notes. If you like this podcast, we would love your help spreading the word. First, please subscribe in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app, so you always know when a new episode is released. Second, forward the episodes you like to friends and colleagues, or share them on social media. 
Word of mouth is one of the best ways you can help us reach more nonprofit professionals like yourself. And if you use Apple Podcasts or Audible, please leave us a review. Positive reviews are how many listeners decide whether or not to try out a new podcast. We appreciate your help. For suggestions on topics, guests, or nonprofit organizations you'd like to hear on the podcast, send an email with the subject heading NPFX suggestion to contact at ipmadvancement.com. For back episodes and more resources like white papers, infographics, and blog articles, please visit the free IPM Advancement nonprofit resource library at ipmadvancement.com forward slash resources. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.